Live NFL trivia every Tuesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge and have a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. There are some stories throughout the history of the NFL that seem made up because of how unrealistic they look. There are some stories that if someone told them to you, you would think they were trying to sell you on a Hollywood movie. You probably know some of the ones I'm talking about. Rams quarterback Kurt Warner going from working the night shift at a grocery store to winning the Super Bowl and becoming a Hall of Fame player. Jets kicker Raul Allegri going from unemployed to hitting the game-winning field goal in less than a week and sending the Jets to the postseason in 1991. Falcons kicker Tim Mazzetti going from a bartender in Philadelphia to knocking Philadelphia out of the postseason in 1978. The list goes on and on. But this one might top them all. This one might be a future movie in the making. In November 1989, Cleveland Browns fullback Kevin Mack was not only injured, but was in prison on the first month of a six-month term. Not even two months later, he somehow scored the game-winning touchdown to send the Browns to the postseason and give them the division title. It's a made-for-Hollywood moment. And this is the story behind Kevin Mack's remarkable 1989 comeback. Before we talk about the actual moment, we need some context as to just who Kevin Mack is, because this was not a no-name player by any means. In the second half of the 1980s, you would be hard-pressed to find too many fullbacks in the National Football League better than Mack. The former Clemson back played the 1984 season in the USFL, but the Browns drafted him in the league-wide supplemental draft so that they could retain his rights. Safe to say, that turned out to be an incredible pick, as when Mack did join the Browns in 1985, he made an immediate impact, with him and Ernest Spiner forming one of the best one-two punches in football. In 1985, Mack finished 10th in the entire NFL in rushing yards, running for over 1,100 and finishing the season with over 1,400 yards from scrimmage. As it turns out, Mack and Biner were just the third pair of teammates at the time to rush for over 1,000 yards in a single season. He finished 5th in the league with 5 yards per carry, and made it to the Pro Bowl. Now, the Browns were not a good team in 1985, as even though they made it to the postseason, they went 8-8, eight and, eight, and they finished 23rd out of 28 teams in points scored. For the record, excluding the strike short in 1982 season, they were the first team to ever make the postseason without being above 500 in the National Football League. Kevin Mack carried that offense at times. Without him, the Browns were likely not playing January football. With runs like this game winning fourth quarter touchdown against the Patriots, Mack was putting the team on his back. And throughout the second half of the 1980s, Mack was instrumental in Cleveland's success. In 1986, he scored 10 rushing touchdowns, ranking 6th in the league, and helped guide Cleveland to the AFC Championship after scoring a critical fourth quarter touchdown in the divisional round against the Jets. Also in 1986, he had a pretty big role in a movie called Masters of the Gridiron, which I can only describe as imagine the Browns doing their version of the Super Bowl Shuffle, but instead of the song, try a 25-minute film. I made a video about that movie, which you can check out by clicking the card in the upper right corner. In 1987, he made it to the second Pro Bowl of his career after almost crossing the 1,000-yard from scrimmage mark, as he once again guided the Browns to an appearance in the AFC Championship. The 1988 season was the worst of his career, as his production suffered due to a lingering calf injury in the second half of the season and missed time at the start of the year with a stomach ache. However, it was clear that a healthy Mack was not only a force to be reckoned with, but an instrumental part to Cleveland's offense and success. Unfortunately, when 1989 rolled around, Kevin Mack's life was about to change forever. Throughout the 1980s, the NFL had a major problem on their hands with cocaine. Unfortunately, I would be here for a while if I listed every single incident that happened during the decade, because there were a lot of them. From 1980 to 85 alone, there were 43 players who were involved with cocaine, and that's just those that we knew about. You had the incident involving Stanley Wilson, the running back from the Cincinnati Bengals who relapsed prior to Super Bowl 23. You had a major drug testing controversy involving the St. Louis Cardinals. You had Don Rogers, the Browns safety who in 1986 at the age of 23 died of cocaine poisoning after his bachelor party. Don Reese, a former defensive end, said that cocaine was so rampant in the league that a cocaine cloud covered the entire league adding, I think most coaches know this or have a good idea, except the dumb ones. And as part of this, you had Kevin Mack. On June 28, 1989, at 6 p.m., the Cleveland police were doing a daily checkup on an area in East Cleveland, somewhere around East Tech High School. While doing this check, they found Mack and his car involved in a drug deal. When the police approached Mack, they found 12 bags. 11 of those bags contained powder cocaine, while the other bag contained crack cocaine. Unsurprisingly, Mack, who was the driver of the car carrying two other people, was arrested at the scene. The next day, he was charged with drug trafficking, and was released on a $2,500 bond. Mack entered a rehabilitation program over the summer. From there, it was all downhill. On July 10th, he was indicted by a grand jury on four charges. Possession of cocaine, sale or resale of cocaine, aggravated drug trafficking, 
and possession of criminal tools. Mack pleaded guilty at the end of August to cocaine use as part of a plea bargain deal, with the other three charges getting dropped. One day later, the NFL suspended Mack for 30 days, meaning that he would miss the first three games of the regular season. After serving the suspension, he rejoined the team, and the Browns were trying to get him ready for their Week 4 contest against the Denver Broncos. He was set to make his debut in this critical game against the team that had knocked them out of two of the last three AFC Championships. However, he got injured, and needed arthroscopic surgery on his knee. The comeback was going to be put on hold. And it was put on hold even further one week later, when Judge Richard J. McMonigal sentenced him to prison, getting six months in the Mansfield Reformatory just outside of Cleveland. After he took the plea bargain, nobody saw his arrest coming. To put it into perspective, the Browns cut a player to make room for Mack on the roster, assuming that he would not be in jail. The player was immediately re-signed after the news on Mack's sentence occurred. Everyone was shocked. His wife, Ava, was crying. One of his attorneys, Gerald Gold, audibly gasped, said he couldn't hear anything else because he was that shocked, and that he was too angry to come to grips with the whole thing. Another attorney, John Pyle, said that Mack was understandably disappointed by the news, saying that Mack did everything he's had to do with rehabilitation, and that the judge was taking his livelihood out from under him. It was the middle of football season, and Mack was now in prison while nursing an injured knee. It seemed like this was going to be all that we would see of Kevin Mack in 1989, right? Not so fast. Before I go any further, I should note that this was not the first time that Mack had been treated for cocaine issues. When Mack's attorneys appealed, information came out that since joining the Browns in 1985, he had been involved in the team's inner circle treatment program twice before. Still, everyone involved was expecting nothing more than probation. Now, not only was Mack in prison, but his recovery from the knee surgery was completely out of the hands of the team doctors. Attorney Gold even said that this ruling was going to threaten his career and his health. Basically, whether it was because of his health, or the fact that he was going to be in prison for the rest of the season, his chances of doing anything on the football field in 1989 were as close to 0% as humanly possible. However, one month later, Mack got a lifeline. Because Mack was a first-time offender, his attorneys filed for shock probation. The idea behind it is that there's really no difference between a month or six months. Just the shock of spending time in prison will change a person, and prevent that person from repeating his crime. After 30 days in the reformatory, Mack was now out. He was going to be on probation for two years, had to undergo frequent urine tests, and had to do a few other things including rehabilitation, but he was a free man. Obviously the condition was that he couldn't test positive again. The judge said as much when he released Mack, saying, I want you to understand something, sir. If you have one dirty urine sample, I'll send you back to prison. This was obviously good news for Mack, who seemed to be scared straight by the whole thing, and grateful for his second chance. The bad news, however, was that he did not get anywhere with his rehabilitation. The knee was in awful condition. Whereas he would have been rehabbing in the Browns facility every day as a free man and working with team doctors specialized in training football players, in prison, he was spending his time at the Fraser Health Center of the Orient Correctional Institution. He couldn't run around. He couldn't stay in football shape. He lost a significant amount of weight. Apparently, the health center was so bad that there were rats running around, there were insects all over the place, and the lights were routinely off. Mack was nowhere close to being ready to play, and estimations were that any possible return for the 1989 season would be slim at best. Having said that, he did come back. Against seemingly all odds, he was able to return to action. He got one carry against the Bengals in Week 13, then six carries against the Colts in Week 14, and then a regular workload of 18 carries against the Vikings in Week 15. Still, you could tell that something was off. He was still not in great football shape, averaging just 2.7 yards per carry over those first three games. However, when Week 16 rolled around, in front of a national television audience, Kevin Mack was about to have arguably the greatest and most improbable moment of his storied career. December 23rd, 1989. It's a nationally televised special edition of Sunday Night Football on Saturday night, and it features the 8-6-1 Cleveland Browns and the 9-6 Houston Oilers. The importance of this game cannot be overstated. The winner of this game officially clinches the AFC Central crown, and gets a bye into the divisional round. If the Browns lose, they could be in danger of missing the postseason entirely, depending on how the results on Sunday and Monday go. There was everything to play for, and while it wasn't a true winner-go-home game for the final week of the regular season, it was just about the closest thing to it. Early on, things are going great for the Browns. On the first drive of the game, Matt Barr drills a 32-yard field goal to give Cleveland an early 3-0 lead. After Warren Moon gets picked off on the Oilers' first drive, Cleveland gets the ball back, and three plays later, Bernie Kosar dumps it off to Eric Metcalf, and Metcalf does the rest. This is one of the best individual efforts by any player on a touchdown during that 1989 season, and it gives the Browns an early 10-0 lead. In the second quarter, Kosar hits Webster Slaughter for a 40-yard touchdown that gives the Browns a 17-0 lead. 
the division title is going to be theirs, and they held on to what seemed like a comfortable 17-3 lead at the halftime break. But in the second half, a switch flipped. On the opening drive of the second half, Warren Moon hits Drew Hill for a 9-yard touchdown. Just like that, it's now a 17-10 game, and Houston is right back in it. Cleveland's offense completely stalls in the third quarter, and after Tony Zendejas hits a 37-yard field goal to make it 17-13 early in the fourth, Houston strikes again. With five minutes left, Moon and Hill connect again. This time, it's a 27-yard touchdown. For the first time today, the Oilers have the lead. They are five minutes away from winning the AFC Central, and potentially knocking the Browns out of the postseason for the first time since 1984. Cleveland goes three and out, but eventually, they get the ball back with 2.30 left. If they want to save their season to win it in regulation, they have to go 59 yards. That's what separates the Browns from a division title and possible elimination, depending on how the chips fall on Sunday. Bernie Kozar is able to get Cleveland to Houston territory. With that, it's time to pound the rock. Kozar gives it to Mack, and he gets a first down to get into field goal range. Now the Browns face a third down situation. Kozar gives it to Mack again, and he gets 11 yards. First down for Cleveland. And on the very next play, with 45 seconds left in the game, this Hollywood-esque moment happens. Enjoy the biggest play of Kevin Mack's entire career. Roll the tape. Cleveland continuing to run their hurry-up offense. Block running. Mack again. Second effort, touchdown! In for the touchdown. Holy cow, what a drive! Kevin Mack just gave the Browns the AFC Central title. Two months before, he was in prison, supposed to be locked up until midway through 1990, and with an injured knee that he wouldn't even be able to get proper rehab for. Now, he was the hero. And after the game, as you can imagine, all the talk centered around Mack's heroics. Browns head coach Bud Carson had nothing but praise for him, saying, what can you say about Kevin Mack? When we wanted to get us a field goal, he went in and gave us a touchdown. Owner Art Modell said that he was really happy for Mack and that even though Modell had some doubts about Mack and whether he'd be able to overcome his demons and the surgery, that he was able to erase some of the past. But what did the man of the hour himself have to say? As you can imagine, he was feeling blessed. He said that 1989 had been a really long year, but now all the bad stuff was in the past. Right now, everything felt real sweet. He then added, I guess when all the trouble started, it was hard to see ahead to the good times coming back again. But a lot of people believed in me, and now I'm back. And man was he back all right. What a time to score your first touchdown of the season. Mack bounced back in 1990 with over 1,000 yards from scrimmage, and then just under that mark in 1991. He would wind up playing with the Browns all the way until 1993. When you're a running back and you play professional football for a decade while making multiple Pro Bowls, that is a heck of a career, even if the journey to get there at times was a bit bumpy. But what Kevin Mack did in 1989 was nothing short of remarkable. To go from injured in prison to scoring the touchdown that gives your team the division title in the span of less than two months, is something else. America loves a good comeback story, and this just might be one of the best ones in the history of the NFL. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Monday and Tuesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JRGator9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.